Hello, my name is Mary Davis and I work in the Global Species Recovery Team here at the RSPB. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to the next session of our Egyptian Vulture Conference, where we will hear updates on the status of Egyptian vulture in Asia and in the Middle East. And we will hear a selection of short talks from across these regions, after which some of the speakers will join me here to answer some of your questions. So do remember that while you're listening to the talks, don't forget to enter any questions you may have into the Q&A box. Um, but in the meantime, enjoy these presentations from across Asia and the Middle East. Dear all, dear organizers, uh, thanks for this invitation and for like, giving this opportunity to talk about our work on Egyptian vulture in Armenia. I'm Lucina Aradjanian, project coordinator at the Armenian branch of the German Nature Protection Union. And today I'm going to tell you about our work on Egyptian vulture specifically, its research and conservation in Armenia. So since 2018, the Armenian branch of NABU started a new project, which is called Birds of Prey Research and Conservation Project in Armenia. And uh, the aim of the project is to uh, research, study those species which uh, face uh, illegal poaching events and natural habitat destroyment events, and uh, their nest nesting periods are being interrupted by human influences and um, it was important to start to conduct a yearly monitoring on the chosen species to understand the also nesting success and the tendencies of the population um, within, uh, within uh, the time. Uh, and of course, uh, we had several target species, which include all four uh, vulture species, Egyptian, birded, griffin and cenarius, and golden eagle. Um, so uh, basically, we implement uh, Egyptian vulture research and conservation project within the birds of prey research and conservation project. Uh, before conducting any uh, conservation measure, it's important to have uh, good data behind that to understand if the measure is needed or not and or what kind of measure is needed in the current cases. So it was important for us to create a data, uh, a very uh, good data, which we can rely on uh, on our work. So uh, based on that, we designed our components uh, of the project, which include estimation of nesting areas. Here we also take into account uh, the data which comes from pre previous works of other scientists who implemented field works and did registrations before. And we combine the data, our data and their data to understand the, the population uh, tendencies. And after the second step is the mapping of nesting areas. We plan to have an active map, which uh, will be e will be an easy tool for yearly monitoring. And of course, yearly monitoring of uh, nesting success, uh, we check each year same nests, which uh, we know in the areas. And uh, we also do migration studies via GPS tags and eco-educational activities which we think are very important uh, tool uh, for the future um, conservation measures. So combining all those components and uh, getting a, a very nice base data, we can develop uh, conservation measures finally. So talking about the estimation of nesting areas and mapping, uh, firstly, I want to mention that uh, we started this work since 2018 and we still have a lot of areas to cover which 
hadn't been covered since we started the work. But what I want also to mention is that we succeeded to cover nine nesting areas with 17 nesting couples which are being monitored yearly. As you can see from the map, there are many areas which yet need to be covered, but because of the lack of the staff who can go to the field for the observations, we still uh, do not success to implement it um, to the final stage. Uh, we were thinking of developing a separate project for the Egyptian vulture, maybe uh, with a volunteer program to invite volunteers, experienced volunteers who can go to the nesting areas, search for the nesting areas and do observations and after like, like a help to collect the data, but still need to find the funding for that. And here in this slide, I also want to mention that by the data of the Red Book, uh, uh, there should be from 40 to 60 next nesting couples in Armenia. Uh, still need this information. Still needs a proper check. Uh, it needs a proper check because it's pretty old and uh, new data is in for it's uh, needed here. Talking about migration studies, I have to mention that until now, from 2021, we succeeded to tag three Egyptian vultures, juveniles, not adult ones. Uh, one last year and two this year. Uh, one last year tagged Egyptian vulture was tagged in the northern, from the northern part of Armenia and two this year were tagged from uh, central Armenia. And uh, they were from the same nest siblings. As you can see on the map, uh, the orange dots show the migration route of the Egyptian vulture, which was tagged last year. It successfully passed the sea and its wintering ground was in Ethiopia. And the two ones, like the white and the blue ones, show the migrational route of uh, siblings, which uh, did not pass the sea yet. And their wintering grounds are yet uh, Arabic Peninsula, are in Arabic Peninsula. We hope that next year we will implement more tagging to understand more about uh, migration and um, the, in the wintering grounds and also the stopovers that they make uh, during their migration. As I mentioned in the beginning, educational activities are very important for us and we think it's a very powerful tool to use in conservation. We participate in EBAD uh, events and we announced uh, Egyptian Vulture, uh, the bird of the year in 2020. And we also did many lectures and competitions at schools to uh, raise awareness about the Egyptian Vultures and their importance in the nature. We work with try to develop uh, models where communities will be the ones to protect uh, the species living around their uh, areas. We work with hunters uh, and local naturalists and we try to develop um, um, to develop a network of people who uh, collect data and pass data and also why not analyze the data uh, and they uh, act like rangers uh, but they basically uh, are not involved in protected areas. And lastly, I want to talk about our uh, successfully installed online camera on the Egyptian vulture's nest, which was also shared uh, with the EB international community. And maybe uh, many of you followed the camera. We though had many technical issues and we couldn't install it this year, but we hope we will have it again next year because it was a fantastic educational tool uh, and it uh, we used it in schools, we used it uh, with the communities during our lectures and it had a fantastic effect on them and I hope we will be able to continue this uh, action next year as well. Um, and it's also a very important scientific tool because uh, we were able to follow uh, the nesting period of Egyptian vultures and to analyze their diet uh, based on what they bring to the nest. And, um, 
and we were able to see basically how one juvenile uh, kills the other, the younger one, and uh, yeah, which was also it get uh, very interesting comments from uh, uh, from uh, school kids and from communities. They became closer to nature, and which is very important for us. So they understand that there are many interesting things living around them which they have no idea about but once they know them they start to love them and they think uh, already about their protection i think this is all about our work thanks for listening and we are open for any kind of cooperation we'll be happy to host you here if you want to volunteer for us and we are happy to join uh, ev projects if it's possible and uh, Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Shivangi Mishra, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology, School of Sciences, JCRC University, Jaipur, Rajasthan, India. And uh, I'm very much thankful to Royal Society for Protection of Birds for giving me the opportunity to speak about Egyptian vultures. The title of my talk is Conservation of Egyptian Vultures, New from Panopterus in Uttar Pradesh, India. Background. As we all know that Egyptian vulture is a medium-sized raptor and opportunist scavenger, feeding on large variety of dead animals, including large carcasses, small and medium-sized vertebrates, sometimes taking live prey, insects, and human waste on rubbish dumps. It is the only living member of genus Neophron and has a great mythological significance in different cultures of the world. There are three subspecies or races of Egyptian vultures in the world of which two that is Neophrontopterus panopterus and Neophrontopterus ginginianus are there in India and also in Uttar Pradesh. There are five residential species, Gyps indicus, Gyps bengalensis, Gyps tenurostris, Sarcogyps calvus, Neophrontopterus and three migratory species that is Aegypius monacus, Gyps pulvus, Gyps himalayensis uh, which are present in Uttar Pradesh. These are the two subspecies which are present in the UP, that is Neophron Panopterus Panopterus and Neophron Panopterus Ginginianus. The aims and objectives of my study were to study the population status and distribution of Egyptian vultures in UP, to study the habitat preference, to explore the major threats faced by Egyptian vultures, and to identify the conservational requirements, priority conservation areas for the protection and improvement of populations. The study area is Uttar Pradesh, which is one of the largest states in India and also the most populous state in the country. Climatic variations are very diverse and it ha uh, we have a wide variety of fl flora and fauna present here. This is the map of Uttar Pradesh, India, and these are the divisions of uh, Uttar Pradesh. There are total 18 divisions in UP and the work uh, was done according to the division-wise surveys Ethnology, uh, popul for population status and distribution, the most reported uh, survey technique that involves counting raptors from fixed location is counting raptors as they pass where they congregate during the migrations. The dump sites, slaughterhouses, bone mill factories were surveyed in all the th three seasons. And the counts were made in the late morning, afternoon and evening hours to include the maximum count. We adopted standard methodology and the annual and seasonal variations in adult Egyptian vulture population were recorded in 11 divisions of Uttar Pradesh. Habitat preference. We have assumed that the population size is the representation of habitat preference, and it was tested on the basis of landscape, resource, available, and human disturbance. These are the factors affecting the population size. Distance from water body, rubbish dump, dense vegetation, nearest human settlement, distance from the road, landscape type and the season. The analysis was done and th for the nest size selection, uh, it was assessed on the basis of the characters of the selected and non selected non selected substrate. Nest material use uh, for identifying the material which they have used for building their nest. The study was done. The abandoned nest were brought to the lab and the nest were differentiated into different materials and each category separately weighed to estimate the percentage of nest materials used. For uh, the major threats, 
uh, study focused on identifying the threats from direct evidences and surveys. Uh, different threats like electrocution, roof site destruction, feral dogs, myths, lack of awareness, and road accidents were observed. To identify the conservational requirements, uh, the study consisted of surveys with, uh, between March 2015 to Feb 2019, and the uh, identification of the priority conservation areas was done. Uh, all habitats you studied for population status were assessed on the basis of the standard ecological criteria to be in priority conservation areas for Egyptian vulture conservation in UP. The research strategy adopted both quantitative and qualitative research methodology, methodologies. The in results for the status, the annual mean population of adult Egyptian vulture was calculated and there was an insignificant difference between the years suggesting no change in the population over the years this is the box plot showing the annual population differences from 2014 to 17. the largest population was recorded in lucknow division and smallest in Meerut division the administrative divisions showed significant differences in adult population levels and we have observed the maximum egyptian vulture population in lucknow division as we can see from the box plot the significant seasonal differences were also observed. Highest population was recorded during winters, but no significant population variations were observed annually. In dry season, it might, uh, it might be due to the fact that during the dry season, the food finding is easy due to the availability of carcasses. This is the map showing uh, the Egyptian vultures in UP. And these are the GIS maps division-wise in different divisions of Uttar Pradesh. These are the glimpse of study areas in UP. At Unnao. For habitat preference, landscape character did not influence the population site at the observe, observation sites. Season distance from the nearest rubbish dump were the only factors influencing the population. And we have observed maximum population in the semi-urban areas followed by agricultural and then urban and forest areas. Season, water availability and food access are the primary factors driving the population size of Egyptian vulture. This is the GAM model, generalized additive model, showing different values. And this is the box plot showing the seasonal differences in Egyptian vulture numbers at the feeding sites. This is the congregation of two subspecies at the rubbish dump of the slaughterhouse in Unnao. The dust bathing individuals. This is the video uh, of recording of the site at Unnao, where maximum number of Egyptian vultures were observed during the surveys. This is the graph showing the population and rubbish dump relationship, and we have observed maximum individuals near the rubbish dumps of slaughterhouses. Some foraging behaviors have also been observed as these. This is the video of showing the showing the edu being the shape at the stem side. We can see that Egyptian vultures are social feed feeders and they have been observed feeding with crows, black kites, and cattle egrets and dogs. There is a plenty of livestock uh, population present here in UP, and the food availability is high near the dump, dump ground of slaughterhouses. For nest size selection, we have taken the selected and non selected uh, substrates uh, uh, sites, and the Egyptian vultures preferred high nesting points, usually located in undisturbed areas, but close to a good quality habitat near the food and water res resource. The nests were made close to corn specific nest. This is the breeding success, fledgling success at each level of factors which tested. If all the active 43.8% nest successfully fleshed, city and substrate wise distribution of successful nest is given below in the table in different breeding sites in Uttar Pradesh. For nest material use, we have uh, done the uh, 
uh, deconstruction of nest abandonedness and we have found that the anthropogenic matter constituted the highest percentage followed by animal matter and then plant matter and uh, it shows that egyptian vultures how they are connected to humans why they are opportunistic feeders also and why they have been seen associated with humans because they have seen very often using the waste uh, of uh, waste generated by human beings uh, they they have used those waste in their nest also these are the different constituents the old nests were often reused and the nesting and roosting usually occurs within or immediately adjacent to the water body they prefer mature trees also for nesting and the areas which are camouflaged like this the green cover and the temples this this is a glimpse of breeding site study the nest material differentiation board should display the potential threats were observed were lack of awareness followed by feral dogs interaction then road accidents electrocution and the prevalent myths and habitat destruction this is the year wise prevalence of major threats observed during the study period other threats like closure of slaughterhouses dehydration were also observed this is the glimpse of threats observed in the study areas and the natural calamity also sometimes harms the major tools of vulture conservation in uttar pradesh we have identified the priority conservation areas in up with several variables were selected and the sites at rai bareilly gonda lakhimpur khiri lucknow bareilly agra were identified as the sites which fulfilled the standard ecological criteria to be in the priority conservation areas for the egyptian vulture conservation in uttar pradesh household survey was also done in different villages near the breeding territory and a very important implication of our study was that the respondents started showing great interest in knowing about the egyptian vulture and their conservation this is very effective as overall in whole up the lack of awareness was found as one of the major causes of negligence towards the declining population of egyptian vultures the key informants were very helpful during the interview and involvement of local community has proved beneficial for the study these are responsible for generating generating the first hand information on egyptian vulture in study areas different mass awareness campaign and uh, workshops and trainings have been organized in different schools with low bird watchers in between the forest officials this is a glimpse of workshops and training programs a team of active volunteers has been made to spread the information regarding egyptian vultures at all the prominent sites in up and those volunteers are still in contact during uh, at present till date also and they keep updating regarding any information which is related to egyptian vulture and their conservation mass awareness has been done the flyers and pamphlets have been distributed among different community this is the awareness material in local language in hindi to print media through electronic media the mass awareness done during the study period conclusions uh, this study illustrates the capability of egyptian vultures to utilize different habitats different root substrate as well as point out the importance of these sites study of egyptian vultures in unnao offers the possibilities to study about their, their biology ecology at different levels highlighting their importance and the need of conservation the study could help in developing strategic plans strat and strategies and to plan for the conservation of species in big part of its global range the recommendations uh, to preserve the old isolated mature trees uh, to protect the utilized habitat from disturbance and logging the availability of adequate food and water will further help in enhancing the vulture numbers in the region as the egyptian vultures have a strong association with dump grounds of slaughterhouses and other agro based factories the protection of the legal slaughterhouses the establishment of vulture restaurants according to the local conditions of uttar pradesh could be done and there should be the protect, protection of the communal root sites congregation sites and dust bathing habitats and the work will establish the studied regions as the important egyptian vulture area that harbors these 
a majestic species of conservation concern. So it's a glimpse of active awareness activities done. Acknowledgements. I'm thankful to all of you. I'm thankful to RSPB and everyone for listening my presentation so patiently and giving me the opportunity to speak about it. Thank you so much. Hello to everyone. My name is Anna Tan, and I would like to present our work and presentation Filling Gaps in the Estimation of the Egyptian Water Population in Uzbekistan. This presentation was prepared together with our national uh, group of Central Asian Waters, Dr. Vladimir Dobrev, Valentin Soldatov, and Dr. Robert John Bernstein. In contrast to well studied population in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, almost nothing is known for the Asian migratory population of the species. The Central Asian population of the Egyptian water is the most poorly studied throughout the range of the species. Very little systematic work has been done on Egyptian water in Central Asia, but there is an estimated to be less than 2,000 breeding pairs uh, information from Birdland. Uh, Uzbekistan is positioned at the core of the Central Asian flyway and is a potentially important country for many migrants on, the, on this flyway. First estimation of Egyptian water in Uzbekistan has been done by Abdul Nazarov in 1990 as 550 individuals. In 2000, the estimation was about 200 pairs by Sergei Sklerenko. The study on the status of the Egyptian vulture was conducted in Uzbekistan uh, Society for the Protection of Birds in 2009. Uh, USSPB initiated the survey in 2010-2011 with the support of Bird Pair Project. On the base of data 2000-2010, the species population was estimated as 135 pairs and showed a decrease of 26% of the population. This data formed the basis of the Egyptian Vulture Action Plan published in 2011. A characteristic feature of this data was that the assessment of the population of the Egyptian Vulture was made based on the number of observed but not evidence-based population survey. The assessment was also based on personal communication with a specialist from nature reserve and other protected areas, as well as scientists who constantly work in a particular region of Uzbekistan. Uh, now, Egyptian vulture is vulnerable species in Uzbekistan and included in last edition of the Uzbekistan Red Data Book published in 2019 on the base of conclusion that the population of Egyptian vulture decreased on 26%. Potential breeding habitat was developed on base of records uh, over than 100 years. On this slide, we can see the distribution of 135 breeding pairs. They were estimated by known numbers in different geographical regions. On the north of Uzbekistan, uh, in Ustur, the, the number of group was estimated as two pairs and two pairs in Amudaria River. Eleven pairs were estimated for Kizilkum Desert and its low mountains. Um, Nuratau Ridge and Turkestan Ridge, the total number was about 20 pairs. In western Tenshan region, uh, we can see about 18 pairs uh, and uh, Pamira like 5 and 25 pairs near Gisar and uh, 15 and 32 pairs in southern part of Uzbekistan in Babatak and Kogitang. Here you can see the all names of the region with the numbers. The surveys conducted last year showed the gaps in population estimation, and we can see here at least four pairs on the Stuart and uh, at least 22 pairs in Kizilkum Desert, and uh, in surveys in Pistolitao show that there is no breeding habitat for the species. 
Congregation count of the Egyptian altar at dump sites in 2021 and 2022 showed the importance for the Egyptian vulture population. And uh, this year, on two dump sites, we counted 310, 350 individuals of all ages. At least two other dump sites in southern Uzbekistan has the same significance. They are probably the largest congregation sites of the species in the region. The population size probably underestimated. The field work was possible with the financial support of OSME, Oriental Bird Club, Health Conservancy Trust in 2021 and 2022. In the country, permission for tagging vultures was granted by the Institute of Zoology and the State Committee for the Ecology and uh, Nature Protection and with the assistance of uh, Uzbekistan Society for the Protection of the On this last slide, I want to show you our Ayakajitma Lake. It is important bird area and place for breeding of five pairs of Egyptian vulture. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, my name is John Burnside and today I will be talking to you about the results of the satellite tracking of Egyptian vultures in Central Asia. On this map here, we can see the distribution of Egyptian vultures. They occur, they occur all the way from the west of Europe to the east of Central Asia. The Egyptian vulture is migratory, being very well studied in Europe, in the Balkans and in the Caucasus. This work has revealed that the Egyptian vulture is a long distance migrant wintering in Africa and in the Middle East. This work has also shown that the migration period and the wintering period has very important consequences for the annual mortality, demography and conservation of the species. In contrast to these well-studied populations, almost nothing is known about the migration of the Egyptian vulture in the Eastern populations. This gap in knowledge was identified as a key priority to be addressed in the CMS on the Egyptian Vulture Flyway Action Plan. The aims of our Central Asian Vulture Project were to fill in these gaps in knowledge, and we had three primary aims of the work. The first was to describe the migration routes of the Egyptian vultures breeding in Central Asia, then to identify the wintering countries and thirdly, to identify any threats. To address these uh, questions, we focused on Egyptian vulture breeding in Uzbekistan. This is a country that is right at the center of the Central Asian migratory flyway. The Egyptian vultures here breed in the desert on the rocky faces of the few cliffs that exist. In 2021, we managed to tag four juveniles at the center of the country. And in 2022, we tagged five immature or sub-adult birds uh, in the east of the country. The juveniles were tagged just prior to fledging in the nest, while the sub-adults, which were aged between two and four years old, were tagged on dump sites and they were caught with leg traps or snares. All birds were tagged with Ornatella GSM solar power transmitters, and these tags, tags work very well in Central Asia. So on this map here, we have Uzbekistan in the north, India in the south, and Saudi Arabia and Yemen in the south as well. If we look at the migration routes of our juvenile vultures in 2021, the first bird actually flew more than 6,000 kilometers and ended up wintering in Yemen. While the other two juveniles ended up wintering in Rajasthan in India. There was a fourth juvenile, but his transmitter never functioned, so we never got any data. From these three juveniles, all of them overwintered in the same locations and they remained on their wintering sites even through uh, all of 2022, but only one of them returned to Uzbekistan in the summer of 2022. You can see the dashed line here showing the route back. Interestingly, this male 
didn't return to his natal site, but returned to the mountains on the border of Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Now, if we consider the five immature birds plus the one returning juvenile, we have the migration routes of six immature birds that migrated in 2022. And if we look at these birds, we see that one, two, three, four, five, and six birds all took very similar migration routes and all ended up wintering in India. In fact, all these birds passed over the Hindu Kush, some of them reaching heights of up to five kilometers. And they all wintered in Rajasthan. If we focus on the wintering sites in particular, here on this map, we can see Pakistan and India on the border. And here we have Bikaner, which is a town in Rajasthan, which beside it is a carcass dump called Jor Jobir. This is a very famous carcass dump that hosts many, many vultures during the winter period. If we look at the migration tracks of our Egyptian vultures, we can see that one, two, three, four of the seven birds that we tracked have all ended up wintering on this carcass dump. Then if we look at the tracks of the other three individuals, we can see they all winter very, very close to this area as well. And this shows that our Egyptian vultures from Uzbekistan have a high degree of migratory connectivity between the breeding site and the wintering site because all of these individuals winter close together. So returning to our original map of the distribution and migration of the Egyptian vulture, we are beginning to fill in the knowledge gaps of the global migration patterns. Importantly, we've shown that variation exists in the migration routes of Egyptian vultures breeding in Central Asia, but that even within this variation, actually 87% of the tracked birds wintered in India. We've also shown that connectivity exists between the full distribution of Egyptian vultures through the shared wintering sites with the Central Asian birds connected to both the birds from Europe, Balkans and the Caucasus, and also with birds in India. This means that Egyptian vultures in Central Asia also share the same threats that have already been identified in these wintering areas. Lastly, the high migratory connectivity that we observe in the Uzbek population, i.e. meaning that all of the birds or nearly all of the birds winter in the same site, means that this population could be particularly vulnerable to any one-off catastrophic events such as poisoning. So protecting wintering sites, sites such as Bikaner seems to be a very high priority. This work was made possible through the financial support of the Oriental Bird Club, OSME, and also some transmitters were supplied by the Hawk Conservancy Trust in the UK. We would also like to thank the Institute of Zoology in Uzbekistan for supporting our tagging applications. I would also like to thank the hardworking field team, which consists of Vladimir Dobrev, Dobromir Dobrev, Anna Tan, and Valentin Soldatov, who made all of this possible through their very hard work. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, everybody. My talk today is Egyptian vulture in Kazakhstan. This report was prepared by a team representing Russia and Kazakh NGOs. Igor Karyakin and Elvira Nikolenka from Russia Raptor Research and Conservation Network and Generata Pulikova and Alena Kaptenkina from Biodiversity Research and Conservation Center Community Trust, Kazakhstan. The Egyptian vulture breeds in Kazakhstan on the northern border of its range in the Aral-Caspian region and in uh, southeastern Kazakhstan. 
This map shows the breeding range in Kazakhstan based on the basis of the last 30 years of literature data and our own observation. The total area of nesting range is 175,205 square kilometers. The main types of habitat, habitats of the western part of the range, green circle, are the on cliffs of the Mangeshlag Peninsula, Usturk Plateau, and the Kinderlik, Kaisan, and Kaplankir Plateaus. In eastern part of the range, in yellow oval, dry mountains stretch from Jungarian Alatau in the northeast uh, to the Karatau Mountains in the southwest. The present day breeding range of the Egyptian vulture in Kazakhstan, green areas, was outlined on the basis of uh, author's research combined with encounter data from other mythologists and bedwatchers confirmed by photographs for the period uh, of 2003-2019. In total, 96 breeding territories and 55 active nests were identified and 160 adult birds were re recorded. Comparison with literature data from 1960 to 1980s yellow areas revealed area, areas where vulture nesting has not been con confirmed in the last 20 years. As of 2015, the species population in Kazakhstan is estimated and at uh, 200 to 260 breeding pairs, including the Aral Caspian region, 30 to 40 breeding pairs, mountains of southern east uh, Kazakhstan, 50 to 70 breeding pairs, and the Karatau Mountains with adjacent territories, 120 to 150 breeding pairs. Thus, about 60% of the nesting population of Palche is concentrated in Karatau Mountains. However, considering in uh, adequate surveying of Karatau's southern macro slope, Species population may be higher here and could constitute 80-85% of the entire Kazakhstan population. A 2022 survey of the Karatau Mountains uh, shows changes in the species distribution. While 10 years ago, most birds nesting on large cliff faces in the central Karatau Mountains, now roughly 20% of it identified nests are built on smaller cliffs on the periphery, far from the larger mountains. And the larger cliffs uh, in the central part of the range no longer hosts Egyptian vulture nests. Vultures predominantly make their nest in the rock niches, often placing them in deep crevices up to one and a half to two meters from the edge, resulting in birds flying to the niche and entering the nest on foot. That said, about a third of all pairs nest on open shelves, some, something used old nest of the black stalk and the long-legged buzzard. Each clutch usually contains two eggs, sometimes three. 1.2 to 1.6 nestlings survive to fledge from a successful nest and 0.8 to 1.3 from, from an active one. The lowest success rate was recorded in 2022. The vulture is calendar. Its food is awful and small road dead animals. In uh, 2018 to 2022, there was a global depression in the population of all rodent in the region. The reason is unknown, mostly, most likely as a result of a viral episodic. Against the background of this large-scale population decline, the ration of roadkill played a significant role in vulture diet. Prey include hedgehog, European glass lizard, steppe agama, 
small turtles, small and medium birds, especially European rollers and rosy star starlings. The species occupies a narrow trophic and spatial niche. It needs pasture with a significant number of small and dead animals, as well as mountainous terrain that provides orographic rises. Being a glider, the vulture conserves energy, scanning its forage uh, biotope from above. The birds are not observed to have any significant interest to landfills throughout their range in Kazakhstan. Proximity of uh, two farms, water bodies, and a good road network are essential. Clutch mortality was recorded in 10% of nests, while nestling mortality occupied in, uh, occurred in 20% of nests. The main reason for immature and adult vulture deaths is predation by golden eagle and eagle owl. In years of rodent abundance, uh, their factor was insignificant, but the global depression of all rodent species in 1918-1922, birds of prey began to ex exert considerable pressure on vultures. In 2022, nestlings on every third nest were eaten by a raptor. It's possible that vultures stopped nesting in the high mountain of central Karatau precisely because of golden eagle predation against the back backdrop of a depression rodent population. Predation uh, on open nests occurred much more often than it niches, in niches. In 2022, vulture nests uh, were only successful in niches. Thus, after five years of de uh, depressed, depressed ro uh, rodent population, be absurd the selection of niche nesting pairs, and the stereotype of nesting on open shelves may soon disappear. In 2022, for, for the first time in Kazakhstan, we tagged six juvenile vultures with GPS GCM trackers. This enabled us to track their movement after the de uh, departure as well as their um, autumn migration. During the 2020 migration, juvenile birds flew in the western Sokum Himalayan, Himalayan flyway. They started from nesting sites between September 6 and uh, 23, and after two weeks, they arrived at wintering grounds in India. Five of them are now in Rajasthan, the six in Gujarat. Thank you for your attention. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. It's for your time zone. I'm Milan Baral from Nepal, presenting on the foraging behavior, feeding ecology, and diet of Egyptian vulture in the landfill site of Central West Nepal. This is the outline of my presentation. Egyptian vulture are the smallest vulture, which are endangered globally and vulnerable nationally in Nepal. They are further categorized under appendix second by the CITES. Egyptian vulture have a small size and weak bills. That's why they wait for the torn to feed scarves of the carcasses. They generally congregate on the big rubbish stumps in search of food. Egyptian vulture has wide range of food sources, mainly feeding on the domestic livestock and small vertebrates. Studies from the European countries suggest that the wild mammals, wild boars, domestic mammals, domestic poultry, reptiles, excrements, human refuses, eggs, and invertebrates contribute to the major diet of the Egyptian vulture. In Nepal, one is the present absence survey, breeding success, and nest site characteristics of Egyptian vulture have been studied. The output of the present study which will help in the conservation planning and direct management decision for the conservation of Egyptian vulture in Nepal. The objective of the study was to assess the foraging behavior of Egyptian vulture in the landfill site of Central West Nepal, to examine the feeding ecology of the Egyptian vulture in the study area, and to determine the diet of Egyptian vulture in the study area. The study was conducted in the landfill site of Pokhara Valley of Kaskir district. 
which is geographically located at the lap of Mount Annapurna mountain range. Seti, Modi, and Modi rivers are the major water sources found in this study area. Among the nine species of vulture found in Asia, all of them are found in Pokhara Valley. Pokhara Valley is also considered the hottest spot for Egyptian vulture with large population in the landfill site. That's why the landfill site of Pokhara Valley was chosen as a study area. The preliminary survey was conducted on 1st and 2nd September 2021. The foraging behavior was, was studied from 19th September to 20th September 2021 from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. 10 minutes video in, in every observation were taken following the focal sampling. Feeding time, foraging time, number of pigs, over time, and maintenance times so were the variables taken to study the foraging behavior of the Egyptian vulture. For the feeding ecology, direct observations was done from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. using the spotting scopes and binoculars. The diet were observed through direct observations and photographs from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. is done by Swan et al. and Burung et al. 2019. The juvenile, subadult, and adult were distinguished following the Clark and Smith 1998. For the diet identification, color and external appearances were used as a basis. MS Excel and aristotelical tool were used to analyze the data, and R map 10.3 was used to develop the map of the study area. While the stratification of the correlation was done is described as Cover et al. 2018. On total 200 meter observation of the adult Egyptian vulture, we found that the adult spent most of his time on foraging, followed by the scanning. The feeding time of the adult Egyptian vulture had moderate positive correlation with the number of pigs, but the foraging time had a strong negative correlation with the all of time and moderate negative correlation with the maintenance time. Correlation between other variables did not show statistically significant values. Moving towards the sub adult, on total 200 meter observations, we found that the sub adult spent most of his time on scanning followed by the foraging. The feeding time of the Sub-adult Egyptian vulture had a strong positive correlation with the number of pigs and moderate negative correlation with the alert and foraging time. Similarly, the foraging of the sub-adult Egyptian vulture had moderate negative correlation with the maintenance while moderate positive correlation with the alert time. Similarly, the alert time of the sub-adult had moderate negative correlation with the number of pigs. On total 200 minute observation of the juvenile Egyptian vulture, it shows that the juvenile spent most of his time on scanning followed by the foraging. The feeding time of the juvenile Egyptian vulture showed a strong positive correlation with the number of pigs while moderate negative correlation with the foraging and alert time. The foraging time of the juvenile Egyptian vulture showed uh, moderate negative correlation with the maintenance time. Similarly, the alert time of the juvenile had mod moderate negative correlation with the number of pigs. Correlation between other variables did not show statistically significant values. Now moving towards the second objective of this study, the feeding ecology of the Egyptian vulture in the landfill site of Pokhara Valley. On total 10 days observation of the Egyptian vulture in the landfill site, we found that the juvenile were the first to reach the landfill site and the subadult were the last to leave. We also found that the higher number of individuals of juvenile were feeding during the morning and the evening time on 7 a.m. and 4 p.m. respectively, while the subadult and adult were feeding in higher number during the daytime. The white term vulture, black kite, black air kite, black brongo were present along with the Egyptian vulture in the landfill site, but surprisingly, there were no any interspecific interaction with the Egyptian vulture. Moving towards the interspecific interactions, the higher interspecific interactions were seen among the adults, followed by the juvenile showing dominance over the adult. The type of interaction were chasing, fighting for food and showing dominance over others. Now, this is the last objective of our research, the diet of the Egyptian vulture in the landfill site. We found that apes contributed to the higher proportion of the diet in Egyptian vulture, followed by the mammals and 16% of the diet were unidentified in our study. Among the apes diet part, 95% were the intestinal parts, and among the mammals meat, 91% were the cooked one. That means they were the residues from the hotel, restaurants, and the picnic sports. Now concluding our study, we found that adults spent more time on foraging, while juvenile and subadults spent more time on scanning. 
for all waltzes, fitting time had positive correlation with the number of peaks and negative correlation with the alert time. Fitting time, foraging time, alert time, and maintenance time are the major parameters that induce the foraging behavior of the Egyptian vulture. Maximum number of Egyptian vulture feed during the daytime. The juveniles were the first to arrive and the subadults were the last to leave the landfill site. There were no any interspecific interactions and the interspecific interaction was seen higher among the adults followed by the juvenile showing dominance over the adults. Apes contributed to the higher proportion of diet in the Egyptian vulture followed by the mammals. These are the differences that I have cited in my presentation. I would like to acknowledge the research committee of the Institute of Forestry Pokhara for providing financial aid to conduct the research. These are the photo plates that I have taken during the field observations and field assessments. Thank you for your patience. Good day, everyone. My name is Muhammad Jamshed Iqbal Chaudhary and I'm work, working as Senior Manager Research and Conservation with WWF Pakistan. I'm also heading Pakistan Virtual Restoration Project. I'm talking about distribution, population status and threats to Egyptian vultures in Pakistan. Um, Pakistan Virtual Restoration Project involves both ex situ and in situ conservation initiatives. In ex situ conservation, uh, Changamanga Vulture Captive Breeding Center was established in 2005 in the Punjab province of Pakistan, and its objective was to maintain a viable population of white trunk vultures in captivity and produce vultures for release back into the wild. And currently, we have 30 white rock vultures, including 15 birds raised in this activity. In in situ conservation, uh, the objective was establishing uh, vulture uh, safe zones free from NSAIDs, monitoring populations of vultures, monitoring NSAIDs in veterinary markets, advocacy and lobbying to ban harmful NSAIDs, establish nature clubs at schools in vulture safe zones to sensitize school children about the importance of vultures, and also in increase awareness through media awareness sessions and training among veterinarians, farmers, and communities. Regarding this, uh, Vulture Safe Zone was established uh, in uh, 2012 in Parkar in Sindh province of Pakistan. Further, we are also working uh, uh, to establish a Vulture Safe Zone in Azad and Jammu Kashmir area. Regarding the distribution of Egyptian vultures in Pakistan, they are resident summer breeder and winter visitors in Pakistan. They are extremely widespread and adaptable uh, and are found in plain, desert and mountain areas of uh, uh, almost all provinces and territories in Pakistan. So they are found uh, nesting on trees and cliff ledges in Pakistan. Further, there are also reports of wintering birds coming from Central Asia, Uzbekistan to Ran of Kutch and Karanjir, uh, Kokrapar area of district Thar Parkar in Sindh province of Pakistan, where the resident population exists and their further movement across the border in India. This migration uh, establishes for the first time that the Central Asian population of Egyptian vultures show connectivity to the Oriental uh, Asian population. So uh, there are the two maps. Uh, in above map uh, of Pakistan, the uh, green uh, area shows uh, the resident uh, distribution, uh, resident population of Egyptian vulture in Pakistan, and uh, uh, the yellow uh, area shows uh, uh, the summer uh, breeder uh, uh, population. And uh, in the map below, uh, the, the this shows. Uh, the uh, migration movements of uh, two satellite tagged uh, Egyptian vultures um, uh, from Uzbekistan to uh, Pakistan uh, in, in, in the south portion of uh, the Pakistan and then uh, further into the India. Um, the population status of uh, Egyptian vultures in Pakistan is scarce. However, few studies estimated population in Sindh and AJK area of Pakistan. Uh, here is overview of uh, uh, population counts of uh, Egyptian vultures in Pakistan through literature. Um, uh, although this literature is not recent, but uh, 
uh, you know that uh, in Pakistan, uh, uh, not much work has been done uh, on the Egyptian vultures. So uh, according to Iqbal et al, uh, 2011, um, he found uh, 457 uh, Egyptian vultures uh, at uh, 77 different localities in three provinces of Punjab. Similarly, WWF Pakistan's uh, unpublished data in 2014 shows uh, uh, and recorded 584 birds uh, in Nagar Parker area of uh, 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 Sindh province in Pakistan. Uh, regarding the threats and challenges, poisoning, habitat degradation, forest fire, collisions, and electrocution and human disturbance are the threats to vultures in Pakistan. Vulture toxic NSAIDs, including cyclophenic, ketoprofen, and clonixin, are available in the market. Human diclofenic being used in veterinary practices. Ecosystem services of vultures are not valued by the society. Meloxicam formulations need to be improved. Uh, species are protected by their habitats are not. Species are protected, but their habitats are not. Looping of trees and harvesting of medicinal plant Google and breeding colonies during the breeding season of vultures, and of course, funding and high field cost in remote landscape of uh, uh, vulture safe zone uh, is a big challenge in Pakistan. Uh, way forward is uh, lobbying to uh, ban harmful NSAIDs that is cyclophenic, ketoprofen, and clonixin, uh, incentivize improvement of formulation of meloxicam and register and other safe NSAIDs that is dynamic acid. Uh, regarding uh, uh, Egyptian vultures, the congregation sites of migratory uh, Egyptian vultures should be uh, considered a priority uh, for the conservation of uh, the species, not only along the Central Asian flight but in general, there is also need to start with establishing monitoring program for uh, these sites, exchange information to understand better to origin of uh, to understand the origin of these birds and their uh, seasonal dynamics and uh, population assessment, including surveys of the nesting population at national level to better understand distribution and population uh, status of uh, Egyptian vultures in Pakistan. So uh, that's. It's uh, uh, all about uh, uh, the distribution and uh, status of uh, Egyptian religion in Pakistan. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having uh, me with you in this interesting conference. Uh, today, I'm going to speak about the culture uh, in Saudi Arabia, their status and conservation. Uh, the contents of my presentation, I will take uh, the species, especially the ones which is breeding and also the ones which is migrating, then looking to the threats and the conservation measures that's been uh, happening in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the status, we can be divided in three categories, the breeding and migratory species, which is our four. And the migratory species, which is the Serenius vulture, and the vagrant. The vagrant is only recorded once or twice, or less, we can say less than five times, which is the robils and the white backed vulture. Start with the Egyptian vulture. The Egyptian vulture is declining as a breeding population. And you can see in the, in the map, there is several being recorded quite a uh, time ago, like, but now it's, uh, as I said, it's breeding uh, is declining. And there is a migratory population. There we have population which is spending the winter, and there are migratory uh, breeding uh, population which is also migrate to go to Africa. And there is one resident population which is in Farasan Island. Uh, the work in Saudi Arabia in the, in the Egyptian culture is started a long time ago, which is only for looking to the breeding and sighting only. But in 2019, the first con uh, work was uh, uh, initiated, and this is it's a collaborative work with, uh, in the life, Egyptian life, uh, function, Egyptian culture life uh, project with the Bulgarian and the Sa and bird life Middle East. Uh, which is conducted in 2019 and 2021. In between, it was a pandemic and no work being done. The result of that work is the congregation side with 200 uh, individuals there. And also we identify two hotspots 
uh, of dangerous power line and also identify the threats, which is almost uh, indirect poisoning through the, the issue of diclofenic, which has been sold in, in really in a high in most of the pharmacies being visited. And also uh, we determined that there is also poisoning for uh, in the food, which is uh, uh, which is targeted the large uh, or the, to control the mammal scavenger, but uh, of course uh, the fungi are being affected. Uh, the second one, which is the griffin vulture, the griffin vulture, although we have increased in sighting in the recent years, but the breeding population is declining, and we think is there is a low productivity, especially in some areas, and the population being estimated in the Arabian Peninsula in general, which is 5,000 birds, but we think in the, of course, the majority will be in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the first work I want to mention in the Griffin Fulcher was conducted in the southwest, and there is a, a guy called Awata Shahri. He's a, actually a volunteer, and he's uh, uh, he he was monitoring uh, uh, colonies of Fulcher in his area. So during the weekend, he he visited his family in his hometown. He came and recorded this uh, this vulture and monitored the population and nest and breeding. And he started in 2017 until 2022. 22 is not the result of 20, 2022 is not there. However, you know the the total number of nests during the five years only it's it's uh, only 32 nests and only six out of them that has been uh, success to. Uh, reached the fledging and the bird flown from the nest. Another interesting thing is that he uh, noticed that there is uh, some some bird which is uh, tagged in neighboring country start breeding uh, in 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 the area, which is show that this this population probably a my a meter population. The related to the function from this study is also identify the threats, which is the poisoning, uh, 13 uh, individual of griffin vulture of 35 kilometers from this colony being found. Also predation uh, from, uh, especially in the egg time, uh, uh, predation of eggs, it's uh, through the uh, fantail raven is being affected by uh, these, affecting these vultures. Another study is in the northern part of Saudi, and this is started last uh, last year, actually, in the end of last year, and continuing for one one season as the bird started uh, nesting. They identify 46 nests, 22 were active, and 24 were not active. Uh, in this work, the uh, a long time, a long term project will be started looking to the satellite tracking, see the movement, listing, monitoring, and feeding ecology. So, a restaurant uh, uh, will be started to have a, a safe zone for the vulture. Public awareness is also interesting. The difference between the, this colony and the other colony that this colony are uh, scattered, you know, in different small uh, rocky area, but the ones which is in the southwest is uh, higher uh, in elevation. Uh, uh, different than, uh, than this this one, and also is continuous mountain uh, area. The other species was the lebit face vulture. The lebit face vulture is concentrated in the western central part of the, uh, Saudi Arabia, and it's been monitored in one of the reserves for more than three decades. And the population was fluctuating, fluctuating, uh, and we think that the population in uh, in Saudi Arabia is probably the mo the only viable population. There are some breeding also in Oman. And I believe they started some work there in, in Omar for doing the monitoring and satellite tracking of these species. Another work which has been done is to look to the this nest distribution and also the uh, some different uh, issues in the breeding. And we found that you know the number, you know, the, the, the nesting distribution it changed from cluster one in the early of the study uh, to be distributed in different part of the reserve. Another thing is changing in the species used for nesting. Uh, in the early day in the early years was using marua, then slowly, slowly declining and start using other species which is the dominant species in, in the reserve, which is acacia. 
Also, monitoring of uh, chicks and adults using satellite right tracking and also normal tracking and VHS uh, uh, tracking. And the interesting thing is that we found that uh, the, the nestling, uh, which is being fitted with uh, transmitter, being uh, you know gradually the distance used to be away from the nest, it's uh, increased significantly. And another thing that the, uh, we found some of the birds in the early, in, in the first two months after fledging, uh, they move an area uh, more than 300 kilometers from that place. And of course, the satellite tracking, they move uh, uh, more than that area. The other work which has been done, it's a uh, heat effect in the nestling because, you know, uh, the fledge, the, the nesting, the chicks fledging during uh, Ju uh, June, beginning of July, which is really the time which is the, the, the weather getting really uh, high temperature. So to see the effects, because we found some chicks dying from, or other died in the nest as a result of poisoning. So we think that uh, maybe this will be also another cause of uh, effect. Uh, and the results show that, you know, the, the body temperature is increased, especially during the uh, midday to when the temp air temperature is increasing. However, the, the difference between the minimum and the maximum actually is only between one and one and a half to three and a half uh, uh, degrees centigrade. The other species, which is the bearded vulture, bearded vulture is actually the last sighting of this species was in 1993, which has been, we think that it's no longer breeding uh, in Saudi Arabia. And there are some uh, population in, in Yemen. Uh, however, in Saudi, the, there is an idea to start, uh, to start the uh, reintroduction program in and for this species, of course, after doing all the necessary studies before we do this. The other, the other species, which is Serenus vulture, which is a, a, a migratory species spending the winter in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, regarding the threat, as I mentioned, the intentional int poisoning is one of the really big issues. And of course, electrocution and collation, there is another uh, problem also is monitored in, in Saudi. There are other uh, issues, also other threats in, uh, in there. Uh, as a conservation measure, uh, we started, of course, the implementation of the Fulcher Action Plan, which is one of the goals in the coming years. And uh, we already started with environmental strategy being developed, legislation, which is including hunting law and trade, uh, hunting and trade laws, and also by starting a platform and, uh, you know, controlling all the people who are having license or doing any uh, illegal things. So they will be connected to the uh, all of their information will be put in, in this platform and will, will be monitored. And in the same time, you know, they will be affected by all their uh, work will be stopped, you know, because they connect all their information. So if they did any violation with the with the bird, uh, with any violation from hunting or uh, trade, they will be uh, caught uh, and they will be stuck. So they're, you know, they cannot, uh, you know, renew their license, driving license. They don't cannot have uh, their passport, so they will be really uh, in a tough situation. Uh, environmental police also have been established for implementation. They started with the protected area research and monitoring already, as I said, has been uh, started, and we have a new project which is uh, now will be started in next year budget. The protected area with the establishment of the Royal Protected Area, the, uh, our goal in Saudi to have 30% of the country protected. Uh, we also conducted different workshops with stakeholders to conserve the culture, especially with the utility companies and also with the, regarding the issue of the acrophenic with the health and veterinary agencies and uh, company and pharmaceutical company. Uh, Saudi Arabia also uh, yeah, you know, uh, a member of different uh, important uh, international intergovernmental agreement like the CBD, CITES, CMS, uh, Raptors MOU, and other, which is uh, f uh, taking the consideration the vulture and other birds of prey. Thank you.
thank you very much for having me with you. Thank you. Good day, everybody. I am Mohammed Habib, biodiversity consultant living in Horgada, Red Sea, Egypt. I will give a talk today about update the status of breeding and wintering Egyptian vulture in Egypt from 2012 to 2022. This project has been started in 2012. It is my baby. I love it. My passion. And this is why I pay for it. I'm not connected with any funding agency. First, let's start with the Egyptian culture. And what does the Egyptian vulture mean for our culture? If you visit any temples or mon monuments, you will realize that the Egyptian vultures in most of the walls, uh, drawings, because it is the first letter in, alphabet in ancient Egyptian alphabetical. So the Egyptian vulture indicate the letter A. So A, when you mention apple, you need to start with drawing the Egyptian vulture. So the Egyptian vulture was one of the most important letter for ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic language. And in the, in the other side, it was respected, protected, and one of the holy birds and animal in ancient Egyptian culture. Egypt is our study area, and Egypt is very important for the birds' migration, especially the Red Sea Rift Valley, which hosts the migration of over 2 million birds through the region, with the soaring birds in huge flocks numbering tens of thousands migrating from wintering ground in Africa to the breeding ground in Europe and Central Asia and vice versa along the second biggest flyway in the world. Also, Egypt received broad front migration through the Mediterranean Sea. Our methodology, we do have three objectives to look for in the survey. Number one, the breeding area, and number two, wintering area, and number three, the stopover location. Findings and result. Breeding and wintering and stopover location in Egypt from 2012 to 2021. We need to start from the southeast part of Egypt, where are the main two locations for breeding colonies. Number one, at Alba, protected area. Number two, at Alaki, protectorate. While one, two, three, four, five in red circle, representing the main stops over of white of, of Egyptian vulture in Egypt during the spring and autumn migration. Mating in, for Egyptian vulture start from the middle of March till the end of April. And uh, from the video, you see the mating of one of the pair at Alaki protected area. Those video been taken by my colleague, uh, Mohammed Farouk from Aswan. And here is the parents with a fledgling in 2013, end of July. Here is the result of all our findings from 2013 to 22, you can see that it's uh, all the information of adult fledgling sub-adult is together. So I split them. Adult count 
in April, we count four at Alba and three at Alaki. August, 22 in Alba and five in Alaki. 2016, we count three adult in July, only in July. 2017, 20 adult in April. 2018, five adult in April. 2019, 15 adult in July. 2020, two adult in Alaki and two adult in Alba. 2021, seven adult in Alba. 2021 in July, two adult in Alaki. Then 22, we have three adult in April and two adult in July. Sub adult, sub adult was in 2015, five in Alba, two in Alaki. In 2017, I found we count 27 sub adult in Alba. 2018, seven sub adult in Alba. 2020, one sub adult in in Alba. And in December, 15 sub adult in Alba. 21 sub adult in April. 22 two sub-adult in Alba. For fledgling, in 2013, August, at Alba protected area, we count 10 fledgling, and at Alaki, we count three at Alaki. While in 2016, we count only two at Alba protected area. While in 2019, we count 15 fledgling in April, and this is the highest number we count in the whole project. Egyptian vulture is unlike labbit face vulture. Egyptian vulture prefer to feed on fresh dead sheep camel and chicken while in labbit face vulture he can feed an rotten and uh, dead animal since over two three weeks time and here is the sub adult of egyptian vulture standing on a top of dead camel being killed by car accident and he's, the, the, the camel is really fresh. So the both of the Egyptian vulture and leopard feast uh, was aggregating around the, the caracas of this dead body. Who eat first? We always say first in, first surface. And from the photo, you can realize that the leopard face vulture is eating while the Egyptian vulture whatever it's adult and sub adult is watching till they have the chance to eat uh, even during the fighting between labbit face vultures together do egyptian vulture drink fresh water during migration yes they do that during migration. They so regularly they stop over at sewage bond or fresh water from the uh, a well in the middle of the desert or the irrigation area at resorts. Resorts is uh, uh, very important at the moment for many of migratory birds at the Red Sea coast in Egypt. In conclusion, from the count 
started in 2012 to 2022, indicating that the breeding population may now have started to increase slightly again. Further research is needed to understand the breeding population at Egyptian Red Sea and Wad al -Alaki. In the end, many thanks to Dr. Muhammad Salim, head of EEAA Natural Conservation Unit, uh, Dr. Ayman Hamada, head of the Biodiversity Unit, and Dr. Tamer Kamal, manager of the Red Sea National Parks. In the end, thank you. Hello everyone, and thank you for giving the Environment Society of Vermont the opportunity to be here today. For those of you who have not heard of us before, ESO is an NGO founded in March 2004 by a group of Vermonties representing various regions and professional backgrounds. The organization's vision is to work towards the protection and the conservation of Vermont's natural heritage and biodiversity. And we work on a number of different marine and terrestrial programs, including those on whales and dolphins, marine turtles, Frankincense trees, and finally, raptors, such as the Egyptian vulture. My name is Rabab al and I am the Conservation Outreach Coordinator at the Environment Society of Vermont. I am honored to be here today to present on the collaborative conservation efforts of Egyptian vultures in the Sultanate of Vermont. The raptors are key indicators to the overall health of the environment, and they also provide numerous ecosystem services of high value. Oman is lucky in that its geographic location supports over 39 different species of raptors, including two endangered vulture species, the Egyptian vulture and the lava face vulture. In 2012, ESO started its raptor research and conservation program, focusing on the breeding activity of Egyptian vultures. And the program had a number of different funders over the years. And just for reference, this is where Oman is broadly located on the map. Looking more broadly at Arabia, dense resident populations of Egyptian vultures occur on the islands of Socotra in Yemen and Masira Island in Oman. The first set of nesting surveys started with funding from the Hema Fund in 2012. The study was conducted on Masira Island, the largest island in Oman, located at the northern east coast of the country, as you can see on the map here. The study found 92 active and old nests within 53 nesting territories on the island, all of which were located within holes or crevices on steep mountain slopes. One of the most notable findings of the study is that Masira Island has one of the highest number of breeding territories in the world and can be considered the second most important location for the species globally after Socotra Island in Yemen. The number of individuals on the island was also noted to be four times higher than that historically recorded in 1970. Some of the factors that may be contributing to the large resident Egyptian vulture population on Masira Island is the lack of human disturbance at nest and existing waste handling protocols, including the presence of open dump sites. The next phase of funding was that kindly provided by Shell Development in 2014, where the importance of dump sites and the waste management sector to the Egyptian vulture population was explored. Counts of Egyptian vultures were made at Masleta dump site between 2013 and 2018. These studies bring to our attention the importance of repeating past surveys for both breeding vultures and dump site counts as a means for monitoring populations, as well as further understanding the effects of waste management on avian scavengers. As part of this fund, a leaflet was also produced in both Arabic and English. The leaflet provides a brief overview on the objectives of the project, Egyptian vulture biological information, including breeding information and the molting cases from the egg stage to the adult stage. And this is intended for the general public. Here is also a brief overview of some of the other sites that were visited under the space, including 12 sites and six governance, and 19 dump sites that were visited in 2014 to identify important vulture breeding and congregation sites. There have also been a number of studies on Egyptian vulture satellite tracking, the first of which focuses on the tracking of an Egyptian vulture near Muscat in Oman for 800 days. The flight and ranging behavior of this individual suggests that it transitioned from being a non territory holding floater to a territory holding floater that may have bred. This Egyptian vulture is also the only tagged Egyptian vulture out of the 17 tagged so far that has left the country, confirming that the large numbers we see at landfills are almost entirely resident rather than migrant. The second study focused on the home range and movement patterns of five non-breeding Egyptian vultures, whose home ranges were also estimated. Their activities were noted to be centered around dump sites, 
However, frequent movements out of these sites and to other dump sites was also noticed. And here you can see the movement patterns for a number of Egyptian vultures tracked in 2019. The green dots show dump site locations, and you can see that the bird whose movements are shown in yellow appeared to have held territory and then left it for some time, although the reason for that is unclear, and it could be that it's floating, non-breeding individual. Recent Egyptian vulture satellite tracking data, never mind, suggests that the resident population is actually larger than expected. And so additional searches for Egyptian vulture territories were made in northern Oman in the Hedger Mountains, where 61 occupied territories were found. The sum of these territories, alongside those found on Masira, exceeds the previously published national estimate of 100 pairs, with a new estimate of 225 pairs. Raptors scavenging at the Multiqalantko, Masqat's main municipal dump site, were also counted and aged where possible between 2013 and 2015. A maximum of 458 Egyptian vultures were observed during Muslim counts, where adults were the most common age class seen. This study brings to our attention the opportunities that exist in terms of using waste disposal sites as a means for promoting public education and citizen science, while also benefiting biodiversity. As for our more recent work in 2021, a total of 12 nests were found and surveyed on Masleta Island, where a total of four out of 12 nests were found to be active. Egg loss is also noted, though the causes are unknown at this stage. The difference in the number of nests between this survey and the one in 2012 is most likely due to differences in efforts, but also because the main municipal dump site was closed as a part of an improvement to national waste management procedures. The nationwide upgrade has had an effect on the distribution of available food resources across the country, but we don't know what effect, if any, it has on the vultures. Here are a number of photos that were taken during the most recent Egyptian vulture surveys. You can see that the Egyptian vulture nests occur in holes within cliffs, and that nest contents often include pieces of fabric, animal fur, and tree branches, amongst other items. The third photo shows two eggs within a nest, and the fourth shows hedgehog remains just outside of a nest. And finally, an active nest with both adults present in the final photo. In addition to breeding surveys, we conducted dump site or landfill surveys and electrocution risk assessments at three locations in 2021. Electrocution risk assessment surveys were conducted within one kilometer of each of these landfills and dump sites, and searches for dead birds were conducted within close proximity to medium voltage power lines. There are a number of potential and observed threats to vultures in Oman that are worth noting, the first of which is poisoning. In May 2021, a total of 21 dead raptors were found in close proximity to one of the landfills where monthly visits were conducted. The raptors, which included adult and juvenile Egyptian vultures and one Benelli's eagle, were all located within a 15 to 20 meter radius and were all lying on the ground in similar positions. The explicit cause of death remains unclear for these raptors, as the collected samples were too old for analysis. However, unintentional poisoning is suspected. Electrocution has also proven to be a threat, with several confirmed and suspected Egyptian vulture and lapid faced vulture electrocutions observed near power lines. This year, a number of Egyptian vultures and lapid faced vultures were also reported to be kept in captivity or offered for sale online, indicating wild capture and trade. Declines in food availability are also threats, in addition to plastic pollution and ingestion, particularly at dump sites. Additional threats include collision with stationary and moving objects, habitat loss and degradation, nest destruction, persecution, and hunting. During the past two years in particular, we have also focused on increasing community outreach and engagement initiatives with the aim of raising awareness on raptors, their importance, the threats they face, and ways of conserving biodiversity. This was done through engagement with various members from the community including visiting regional governor's offices, Armani Women's Associations, and schools. And our community outreach initiatives started long before 2021. But we wanted to share some of our more recent efforts in this area, which we plan to continue in the upcoming years. And these most recent efforts were also coupled with the distribution of the Raptors of Oman booklet, which presents an overview of 11 of the 39 raptor species that are found in Oman. And here are a selection of the photos from various government schools that we visited in 2022. In terms of our way forward, we plan to focus on Egyptian vulture breeding surveys on Masleta Island in 2023 and install camera traps at active nests. We would also like to secure funding for additional vulture breeding surveys in the future.
Last but not least, we are currently coordinating with relevant authorities on drafting a national action plan for raptor conservation in Oman. The Egyptian vulture is not the only endangered scavenging bird of prey in the Sultanate, as we also have the endangered lava-faced vulture and step eagle. And so it is crucial that we work on conserving these species and other raptors now before it is too late. Finally, here are the primary papers and publications that were produced as a result of the Egyptian vulture collaborative research in Oman. And if anyone faces any trouble finding these online, please feel free to reach out to us. We would like to present our sincere thanks and appreciation to all project partners, collaborators, and funders for their support. And thank you all for your attention during our presentation. We are proud to be part of this vulture conservation journey. So thank you, and we hope that you all have a great day. Hello everybody, and I'm pleased to be able to make this short presentation about Socotra's Egyptian vultures. I'm doing it on behalf of the Socotra Wildlife Association um, because it's difficult to, for, for them to, to make it because of uh, communication difficulties on this rather remote island. So you'll have to put up with me, but um, I hope that I, my presentation will excite you about this the, the vultures on this wonderful island. First of all, Socotra is situated out in the Arabian Sea. It's a Yemen island, some 300 kilometers south of the Yemen mainland. It measures about 100 kilometers by 30 kilometers, and it's dominated by the Hagia Mountains, and it's famous for its endemism. Indeed, it's often called the Galapagos of the Indian Ocean. Now, the Egyptian vulture is the only globally endangered species that breeds on Socotra, and it probably holds the highest concentration in the world, some 1,900 individuals, and it also it's the only vulture to occur on Socotra. The population was determined by detailed counts made from 1999 to 2011, and the results have been published in the OSMI journal Sandgrouse, Sandgrouse 32, there's the citation at the foot of this um, slide, but uh, that can be made available to others later that are interested. In future, we plan to focus on counting roosting sites for, for monitoring. Um, here we see uh, vultures, Egyptian vultures roosting in a Sturgillaria tree, but some of the main roosting sites are on cliffs. And indeed, the cliffs to the south of uh, Hadipu, the capital of Socotra, can often hold over 300 roosting Egyptian vultures. Cliffs also provide the only breeding sites for the vulture on Socotra. And here they nest typically in caves in the cliff face. Here we can see an adult with a, a well-grown youngster. The vultures are very tame. This is very unusual amongst the Egyptian vultures in other areas. And they, here you can see one sitting by as a Socotri preys. And when you have a picnic, they quickly gather. And, um, and so here you can see um, two Socotri sitting down, having a picnic, and quickly the vultures arrive. And also many congregate at carcasses after a wedding feast. And this particular uh, slide, we see about 20, I suppose, vultures there. That was part of a group of 200 that came down to feed on um, cattle and sheep and goats that had been um, discarded after a wedding feast. Now some start to feed on road kills. Roads are new on Socotra only in the last um, 20 years. And uh, here we see one feeding on a, a dead civet cat, which was introduced to the island uh, quite a few years ago. Now the good news. First of all, vultures are not persecuted. The Socotri highly respect them. They're mentioned in their um, poems, folklore, and children enjoy seeing them. And they really are a respected and, and loved bird, never persecuted as they can be in other places and not trapped, for example, and, and, and uh, traded in any way. Now, diclofenac is not a threat. It was banned on Socotra 
um, by the Socotran authorities, the Environment Protection Agency in 2008. Nevertheless, one's got to be highly vigilant to make sure that it is, it's never used in the future. Wind turbines are not a threat as renewable energy is provided by solar power. So scenes like this of, uh, of, of wind turbines will never be seen on the island. And similarly, power lines are not a threat. The few that exist are being replaced by underground networks. This wasn't taken on Socotra, but it's just a, an image of a power line just to, to make the point that this is not a threat. And the other thing is that deliberate, deliberate poisoning is not a threat. There's no dogs on Socotra. Um, they're not kept as pets. There's no wolves, there's no jackals. And so poisons are not put out on rubbish tips and refuge tips as they are in other countries. So deliberate poisoning, not a threat. The actual threats, well, the main one is waste management is a major concern. And this is because chemical, medical and plastic weight, which is thrown out, could harm vultures. With a rapidly growing population, waste management has become a serious issue, especially in the towns of Hadibu and Kalansia. The growing volume of plastic waste is of particular concern, and because this is often ingested by vultures, we suspect, and chemical and medical waste could also be ingested by vultures, as could be the disposal of poisoned rats. Rat poison is used widely in houses to control rats. Because of the political situation, situation in Yemen, the conflict, that's the ongoing conflict that we all know about, the Socotran authorities are suffering from a shortage of funding for managing waste. So waste management or poor waste management is considered to be the main threat to Socotra's vultures. So as I mentioned earlier, rat poison is widely used in the two main towns. Vultures eat dead rats. So far, we're not aware that this has caused any problems, but this is something which must be looked at and considered as a potential threat. A minor threat, um, but one that needs to be addressed is that vultures are now being killed by cars. As I mentioned earlier, roads have been built in the last 20 years and the Socotri can drive at speed. So quite a few vultures are now killed particularly when they come down to feed on roadkill. So finally, I want to mention vulture awareness. Every year for the last five years, there's been a vulture awareness event held on the island. And this has covered all sorts of interesting things. So for example, there's been school lessons um, given to increase the interest and knowledge of the Egyptian vulture amongst school children. There have been painting competitions, and these have often been part of the International Vulture Awareness Day, which has always been held in September on the island, as I mentioned earlier, for the last four years. And talks on the importance of vultures to the village communities. So here we see a, a group, and, and beyond them, the, the cliffs where the, the vultures roost at night and um, a talk being given by the Socotra Wildlife Association. And these events are off, often end with, a, with plastic clearance. I mentioned that plastic waste is a real serious problem, as indeed it is in many places. And here we see a group of children collecting waste after a vulture awareness day. An action plan is now in preparation, and uh, this is going to address waste management. That's going to be the first thing. Also consider speed limits on the roads to stop vultures being killed. The annual awareness programs will continue. And most importantly, uh, the, the Socotri will be enlisting the support of the Environment Protection Agency right from the very start. So I hope that's given you a, a flavour of the, the work that's being done by the Socotri on this magical island. And Finally, I just want to mention some of the organisations that have supported this work and uh, will be continuing to support it in the future. So thanks for listening.
Hello everyone, today I will talk about the status of Egyptian vulture in Iraq. In Iraq, overall, we have 74 areas which are considered important areas for birds or IDAs. And mostly, especially in Kurdistan region, we have more than 24 areas considered as IDA because of the presence of the breeding population of the globally endangered species, the Egyptian vulture. In Iraq, we have four vulture species, including the Sinirian vulture, Eurasian Griffin vulture, Egyptian vulture, and the Maya. Sinirian vulture is a winter visitor and passage migrant in Iraq. The second one, which is a Eurasian Griffin vulture, mostly they are resident breeders. And the Egyptian vulture is a passage migrant and summer breeder in Iraq. The last one, which is a Lama Gai or Breeder Vulture, are resident birds in Iraq. We have been studying birds and vultures in particular since late 2007. In addition, we have collected some data on interaction between Egyptian vulture and other birds, including we have seen ravens were uh, taking eggs of Egyptian vulture, and also we have seen some interaction between Egyptian vultures with golden eagles and Badbury falcons in some areas. These are the sites which in uh, dark red are considered as a hotspot for breeding vultures, especially. Egyptian vultures. Their population is very high in these areas. Based on our uh, guesstimations, the breeding population ranges between 400 breeding pairs to 600 breeding pairs. Uh, during the last five years, we have been observed some threats that are facing the vultures in general, and in particular the Egyptian vultures, including electrocution collecting chicks and trading also poisoning because in many rural areas when people their hairs and sheep are eaten by predators such as wolves, jackals and in some areas especially near the borders by uh, leopards they poison their dead animals and we have been many we have seen many vultures died in some areas however we were able to rescue or prevent some uh, animals uh, from poisoning by convincing people that what they could do that, that could have a or would have a huge consequences of the not just the wildlife but also the whole ecosystem so we were able to convince them to prevent poisoning the wild dead wild uh, domesticated animals another threat that faced the uh, birds of the region is illegal killing or poaching and based on our studies uh, Kurdistan region considered as one of the areas which have been affected by illegal killing and poaching and last October in Jordan we had a workshop and during our meeting uh, with BirdLife and its partners we have came with a an idea to do a project to conserve the Egyptian vulture uh, in Iraq and in the region because as I mentioned there are different threats that are facing the birds including poaching and trading. Trading is a huge issue because of the lack of implementation of and especially the CITES agreement at the national level. So we are we are trying to implement the CITES agreement and also we have conducted some workshop with the Ministry of Environment and the decision makers and people that are that could have a impacts on mitigating and reduce of the pressures on Egyptian vultures and other birds in the region. Also we came up with the potential action plan that can be done in the coming years including the prevention of uh, poisoning and also the reduction of the animal trading and especially bird trading uh, in the country. Also, 
we will have more activities uh, through involving stakeholders and decision makers at the local and uh, regional level in order to mitigate the impacts on uh, and threats on the Egyptian budget. Thank you very much. Wow, well, what a fantastic jam packed session we've just been part of. Um, so much information from, from across um, Asia and the Middle East on the Egyptian vulture. Um, we have had questions coming in about the, the content being available, and we will make sure this, this, this can be the case either on the project website or through, a, through a, another channel, but we'll let you know about that because we're aware that there's so much information here. Um, We've had lots of questions coming in, and I'm really delighted that some of the of the speakers and presenters are are with me today. Um, for the questions being asked for the speakers that are not here, we will make sure that those those questions will be answered and will will be um, sent back to those that are, that are asking them. Um, and yes, I'm aware we are sort of running over time a little bit, but I hope you can stick with us for sort of 10 minutes so we can address some of the questions uh, being asked um, by our speakers who are very kindly uh, giving up their time to answer them. Um, so I'll um, just start with some, some of the questions then. So um, Anna um, was here, but I'm afraid she had technical difficulties, but I know Vladi, you're happy to potentially answer a question on her behalf. Um, there's a question for Anna about what time of year did did the counts of over 300 birds at a rubbish dump happen in, in Uzbekistan? Do you know what time of year that was? Yeah, we counted the congregation is, uh, congregations in, in the end of July, beginning of August. But uh, in, the, in most of the cases, these congregations are like through, uh, throughout the year, like during the breeding season. And uh, like in number of places in southern and eastern Uzbekistan, so it's uh, yeah. Short answer is end of July, beginning of August. Thank you. Thanks. That's really useful. Um, and you're also here, Vladi, to stand in for John Burnside, who couldn't couldn't come to the this question session. Um, but uh, yeah, there was a few questions on on that talk. Um, um, around are the carcasses dumped at the Jorbeer dump free of NSAIDs or, or could this dump be a, a death trap? Uh, well, it's a uh, Jorbeer is like it's a it's a reserve actually, which is close to the city. However, in the uh, vouchers don't they don't always uh, always in you uh, and only use and uh, and visit the the Jorbeer dam site, but they also they also uh, feed around and uh, like in the in the desert in in the, in uh, in different places. Uh, but however, the 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 threat from the insects still remains, uh, which is also valid throughout India. So it's not like totally safe place. However, it's uh, there is no. Uh, at least there is no signs of persecution or any other uh, threats that might arise from people because they are literally very close to, to the people there. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Um, um, another question on that talk. So how do you explain the differences in, in routes between the fledglings and sub-adults? Sub yeah, I, I saw the question. It, it comes from Ron, from Ron. Well, it's uh, uh, I'm not sure if he has uh, uh, seen the first slides, but uh, generally we have uh, we have tagged uh, eight birds so far, and uh, except for one, all of them follow uh, they follow one migra migration route. So it's more or less they are very as the other Egyptian vulture populations they are very conservative. Uh, regarding the migration routes, and uh, the the only one individual that differs is the one that actually ended up in in Yemen. Uh, however, it, it this might arise from the um, because uh, it was it was stuck in the central Kazakhum desert, and we believe that uh, somewhere 
in this part of the Central Asia, uh, there might be some split in the migration routes uh, with birds further east going and ending up in India and Pakistan and uh, birds originating from the west of, of the Central of Central Asian region. Uh, uh, these are like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Some some of the birds might might be heading to to the Arabian Peninsula. So it's a uh, it's a very interesting actually uh, area. Uh, this central this central Kazakhstan desert because it's uh, obviously birds from this area uh, migrate to different sites. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move on to Milan. Milan you guys are great to talk about um, work in, in Nepal. Um, did you observe changes in the number of, of Egyptian vultures at the landfill um, you monitored? Thank you for the question. Uh, actually, the study was conducted is the partial fulfillment of my undergraduate thesis. And the question that uh, was asked by Bolin uh, doesn't fall under my objectives. But I have planned to study the uh, population status and the landfill site seasonal wise, including the breeding behavior of Egyptian vulture in Pokhara Valley. Okay, so something to follow up on. Um, a question for Professor Shabrak. So, what is the proportion of chick deaths due to overheating? So, how many chicks died? You can't hear? You can't hear us for now. Okay, I'll move on. So, um, no, it's okay. It's getting better, I think. Do you hear me now? Yes, I can hear. Can yes, I can hear. Did you hear my question? Uh, could you repeat it, please? Yeah. Yeah. So, what is the proportion of chick deaths due to overheating? Well, it's different from years to years, but uh, really we uh, we did a look, you know, how is uh, normally when the adult leave the chicks alone, that's the, the biggest problem. Uh, the, and it's very, there is a variation for the number of adults leaving the chicks alone. So in 2021, we had more than five adults are disappearing so that the chicks was found you know, no eggs, no chicks in the in the nest. So because we check it every, you know, they check the the nest every, you know, every weeks. They go and check sometimes every two weeks. So sometimes they come and there is no no no. But uh, when it's three weeks, that's really a critical situation for them. And uh, we had only one observation for the full day, looking after the other is left. So in the middle of the day, the chicks was, uh, you know, the age was around uh, 40, uh, I think it's 42, uh, 42 days or something that it, uh, uh, if, I, if I remember, you know, they, they, the temperature was 42, sorry, the temperature was 42 and it's in the 10th, uh, almost the 10th days old. So in the early days is really, uh, the heat is really dangerous for the, uh, they need the adults to be with them. But the problem, you know, uh, when they when they are adult, you know, sorry, before they're fledging, you know, in the almost like 90, 90 days, that's the really 